So I chose the scripture that I was that I'm preaching on today, which is the first time I've done this. So, um, and I did that for really a couple reasons. Uh, first, I didn't like any of the other scriptures, uh, but but there's so many different ways um, that we can look at this scripture, and um, I just thought we could get into more depth than you can in the pulpit about how you feel about parts of this reading uh, and and how it affects us as Christians and, and where we go from there. So Randy, I'm going to ask you to open us in prayer and then we're going to get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another Lord's Day that you've given to us. We're grateful for this time that we have that we can come together and study in detail your word. We're thankful also for each and every person that's able to be here. And we ask that you would be with each of us. Help us to hear the message that you have planned for us and help us to be open-minded and open-hearted that we would apply this message to our lives so that we can serve you better. Lord, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to get somebody to read Mark uh, chapter 6, and we're going to read all verses uh, 14 through 29. There's, um, this is one of, um, of Mark's sandwich stories again, where, where he starts out on one thought and changes uh, and then comes back to another. So it's, it's kind of hard to break this one up because of, of the way it's, it's written. So if I could get somebody to read all 14 through 29. Read it. Go right ahead. Okay. About it. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted, him, wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Okay. I want to set up a, a kind of timeline where we're at of where Jesus is in his ministry. If Jesus, right after this happens, after he hears of John's death, he goes to a deserted place. But as he's going there, this is where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. And, and they follow along the bank. And as he gets to this deserted place, there's a crowd there that, that wants to be... Uh, you know, wants to be cured and and uh, and wants to hear what Jesus has to say. So this is where we're at timeline. You know, during Jesus's ministry, he's starting to get things ramped up. Um, 
as the story starts, it starts with who is Jesus? And it's it's odd that nobody says that he's the Messiah. You know, some say John and others say Elijah or other prophets, but nobody sees him as the Messiah, as, as the second coming. Um, and then Herod recalls the story of how John was executed. So I want to look at John first. I want to ask a question and I'll, I'll get some feedback of, of how you, what you think about John. Do you think John had the power to tell the king of his moral sins? I don't know about power, but... I, Do you think he I, should have done this? Do you... I don't know. Do you feel that bringing that into today's life, do... not to compare us to John, but do we have the power to tell someone that's a ruler or an Official? That's question number two. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's question number two. Um, I'm thinking ahead, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think more about <clears throat> almost an obligation. More so than does he have the power? I mean, he did it. So. I he felt he so moved. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have stuck his neck out. <laughs> Poor wording there, but, you know. Um. I don't know. If you, is that a form of judgment? That's question number three. <laughs> hey, we're going to be done by uh, 1030. <laughs> so, yeah, so now that we have, you know, three of the questions out on, on the floor, you can follow the letter of the law and still be a very unmoral person, right? In the United States today, you can you can you know follow the the law, the law of the United States and still become or be a very unmoral person, right? So if there is no checks or balances, if no one, you know, if you let them do what they will without any consequences, um, how bad will things get? And to Lynn's point, and to my question number three, and if we do say something, now have we become in a position where we're looked upon, that we're looking down upon people or we're judging people for what they do? There's a fine line there, it's, and it's a very fine line. Knowing who John the Baptist was, I felt like he did it for the right reasons. Like, mm -hmm. I don't feel, just based on his character, that he would mean it in a judgy, change your way. You know, I think he... And I don't think any of us would either. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like that, too. But the recipient may think they're judging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think in most cases, they would. Yeah. So here we're stuck. How do we... He saw nothing wrong with killing his half-brother Philip, divorcing his first wife, marrying his half-brother's wife, who was also a niece by another half-brother. So, I mean, he gets... The more you read and the more you study about it, the worse it gets. He sees nothing wrong with all of this, and he sees nothing wrong with a with his daughter, stepdaughter, coming in and doing a X-rated dance and pleasing everyone there. He sees nothing wrong with all of this. But because he makes an oath or a promise to her, he murders John. I mean, the, the, so where does the morality, you know, 
he makes an oath to her. You can have up, you know, is up to. A, and I'm sure he didn't. He didn't think she'd want John's head on a platter, but he, but he laid it out there. Hey, and he felt the moral obligation to hold that. Yeah. Credit, you know, sure. <laughs> but but he held that. He held up that end of the bargain, I guess. Um, so. And things go on like this today. Now, maybe not to this point, but there is a lot of immorality in the, in the world today. So where, what part do we play in all this as Christians? Or do we? I think so. To me, as Christians, we do have an obligation to do what... God leads us to do. And if here wrong has been committed, God, I feel, will talk to John and led him to share what he did with Herod. Just like, and, and I think you have to be careful because I think it really is all about intent. If God prompts me, let's, let's say... God prompted, let's not say me, let's say Brian or you or David Cooper. Maybe they feel you've done something wrong and it is wrong. God led them to come to you and talk to you about it. To me, that's okay because God prompted it. Right. Now, where we go down the, go off the rails, it's like, man. Then he really upset me. I don't like what he's doing. And it's like a person thing. It's not because God is leaning. It's because we let allow our humanity. So we're going to do this in the name of Jesus Christ. If God tells us to do it. I mean, even though it's, we're going to use it in the name of Jesus Christ, even though we shouldn't in a particular situation like you're just speaking of. Oh, that seems like. That happens all the time. And I, I think it's wrong, obviously. I think it's sinful and wrong, and we are at fault if we fall to that. But that seems like how people do it. People that do bad then and now, they justify their actions. It's like, well, what I did, I had to do because of this. That, that, that just, you know, look at, look at the politicians of today. I guess I always criticize politicians. I probably shouldn't do that. But it just seems like how the world operates. It's not my fault. I was right to do that because of this. And that's that's just wrong. So. But maybe if you start like the Bible's John the Baptist and going to hear that Jesus teaches us, or the Bible teaches us, that you should not commit adultery or whatever, or, or marry your brother's wife or, or you know, if you start out with that, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. a little bit it, more tactful. It, it wouldn't be yeah. so judgy sounding. Mm -hmm. that, that I was taught in the Bible that to steal is wrong. Or, you got to stop stealing her. That's awful. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, it says in here that, I don't know. that, I'm just trying to, that Herod liked to listen to him. So he, I'm sure he is preaching to him from prison here. At every chance John gets, I'm sure he's, you know. So he, he listens to him and he likes what he hears, but it doesn't change what he does or who he is. It's like, well, like Randy said, getting into politics, using that as an example. We have checks and balances in our political system, but if people don't honor that or say, hey, you have a right to tell me that, so it's all about accepting it too. Like you said, you could say, well, we're being judgy, but if you say, okay, you're a man of God, maybe I should listen to you, but that's that's part of it to me anyway. We got family A. Husband, wife, two kids, a boy and a girl. And the husband cheats on his wife and has a girlfriend. And his wife doesn't do anything about it. As his children grow up, and there's no church base here, 
Is that acceptable practice for them when they become adults? I mean, you're a teacher. You know how kids, I mean, you, you've been around kids, Stephanie. You know the influence that a parent has upon them. Um, if that's all they see, yeah. He said, Dad did it, so yeah. and nothing happened to him. Yeah. Just like violence in a, in a home. Sure. When kids learn, they grow up with hate and criticism and violence, abuse, emotional, physical, hopefully not sexual. That's what they learn. They don't know any other way. Yeah. That's the way mom and dad did it. It must have been the right way. Nobody said any different. But then, then there is also the, when we get to be responsible age, we kind of know right from wrong. And we have, I, I guess I, I look at Because you have parents. Christ in your heart. You, you live by a different set of morals. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm not sure. No, I, I agree up to a point with Randy. So you've got a bank manager who has no church in his life. He's an adult. He's a manager of a bank. He embezzles money. He knows that's wrong. It's mm -hmm. against the law. Yeah. Even though he hasn't had any church. But he still, he, so he hides it. He knows it's wrong. He you probably only thinks it's wrong if he gets caught. <laughs> well, it's only wrong if he gets caught, you know. But. But he did it, but that's why he hides it, because he knows if he's caught, there will be repercussions. So, yeah, up to a point, an adult who hasn't had any exposure to church does know right and wrong, because there are laws that and have nothing to do with, yeah, with the church. Exactly. And I look at this as raising a child. I, I'm older than anybody here. I grew up in a time that, I mean, your parents... They, they wore you out with a belt, a limb, whatever. There was a way that, I mean, they treated us like kids. You know, be quiet, shut up, stay out of sight, you know, stay quiet. Before I was, well, maybe I was a Christian then, I don't, but I don't think it really had much to do with it. I knew some of that was wrong. So when I had my daughter, I never, ever, spanked her and I talked to her and I wanted to build her up and make her self-esteem <clears throat> grow and flourish rather than beat them into submission. So what was the consequence for bad behavior? For that person? For your daughter. I, I think I mean you have to you yeah. have to to correct. You have to I mean you can, yes. there's gotta be a set of rules yeah. you live by. Yes. There are other punishments, and you can talk to them. Now, I understand this is, you know, you can reason with children only a certain to a certain point, and then you know they don't get the reasoning thing. But I think it's really important not to crush their spirit and not to hurt their feeling. You want them to understand that they're loved, no matter what. Um, but there also does need to be punishment, discipline, structure, responsibility. I firmly believe that. You just have to do it in a way that doesn't destroy their sense of a person. Just like hitting your kid. My father hit me once with his fist. And, <coughs> I mean, the, that really hurt my spirit. I just think that's 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 just a line we should not cross when with our kids or loved ones. So, yeah. so I have lived for several years that I'm not to judge anyone. It's not my place. They'll be judged at some point in time. I I, I live a life that that I feel is is morally correct as I can, I'm not saying that it is, but the best I can, and I don't judge anybody by the way they live, because I think they'll be judged at some point in time, and you know, and it's not, it's not up to me. It, is that wrong? You know, as I read today in Mark, in the gospel, in, in the New Testament, which we're supposed to live by, 
Come on, Brian. You've been I, thinking for 15 minutes. I, I want to hear what you got to say. I had something that may change the whole how we're thinking about this. <laughs> so Herod probably identified himself as a godly man. The, it was God's reason he was the ruler, he was the king. So is this John holding just some person accountable or calling him out on their actions or calling a brother in Christ out on their actions? He, I, I, I did some studying. He he never was a follower of Christ. He wasn't, but I, and I, I, I thought maybe at some point because of John's planting of the seed that he would have turned. But he ended up in prison for another corrupt thing that he did, and that's where he died. Him and Herodias both. But do you so, think it's possible that he was viewed as a godly person, like even as a Jew, not necessarily a Christ, a follower of Christ? He was of Rome descent, so I'm I'm sure that he was. Right. And I'm sure he played the role. So my question is, is this about calling everyone out, or is it about calling your brothers and sisters of Christ out when you find them? Because if you look at Jesus' teachings, when someone like a Pharisee or someone else is wrong, he, he, he called them out. But you hear like the woman next to the well, and people were like, hey, like he who hasn't sinned, cast the first stone. Like let her like yeah. everyone that was lost or not in the faith, Jesus always approached with open arms. Whereas the people that you could see as heretics or in, inside the inside the faith, he had a strong hand with. So, yeah. is it a thought of should we hold our brothers and sisters accountable, and basically say, hey, that's not how we were taught, but the world at large, we just introduce them to the Lord and let them come themselves, and then once they're in there, then we can start, hey. Came, you need to change the. So did John do it backwards? Maybe in your in your view, possibly, or maybe he thought he was at a place where he could have chance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see that. Mm -hmm. I, I I see that. Uh, I was hoping he had turned to Christ at some point as I was studying. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping that in the end. You know, this terrible person, moral, morality, finally got it. But, but yeah, that's that was just my thought is instead of this person who is just some random Joel Schmo on the street mm -hmm. doing whatever, do we say, hey, come to Christ, da, 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 but someone within the church is doing whatever, then we didn't have a talk. So the, the family A that I that I spoke about earlier, the best um, plan of action, I guess, would be to go to induce them to Christ. I mean, ideally, you would want the wife to be strong enough to stand up for herself, um, have more self-esteem, pride, or whatever, to know that she doesn't need to Well, I think Randy that. goes to that about breaking the spirit a little bit about... What, yeah. what he spoke about. Yeah, and I think even if it's going on, I think deep down the children would see what it's doing to the family. They would know mom's not happy. It's for our job to show them a different way. You know, I know people who I don't know about the affair part, but a woman not completely happy with her husband, but stayed married, mm -hmm. is still married. Well, the excuse was years ago, I'm staying with her for the kids. So she wasn't. That was a, a yeah. Okay. That was a valid. You heard that a lot. Yeah. And just for the record, they're still married. They seem okay, <laughs> but there were times when they're younger years. But um, in your case. And with what you said, the woman's stronger, more self-esteem. What can she do to stop that husband? I just said, I don't like it. You need to stop. Then what's the threat? I guess what's she going to do other than divorce? Right. But our marriage vows are for better or worse. Sure. Till death. Is so fine. there's the conundrum. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it's but... easy because I struggled all week with. So I'm living by this set of, or I, in my mind, I've been living by this set of rules of not to judge anyone. You know, we all need Jesus, not to judge anyone. 
and then you know John who is preparing the way. If you read, you know, if you read why John was put on earth, you know, if you the angels told, you know, Zachariah and Elizabeth, he is preparing the way for Jesus Christ. So I guess at the end, and the last question I had was, did John have to die so Jesus could carry on his ministry? That was, that's, because everything you read, John prepares the way. So in my thinking, if you're preparing the way for someone, once they arrive, you can retire, you don't have to have your head chopped off. <laughs> but it wasn't, of, it wasn't of John's doing. I'm saying is, and Let me get I want you to think, <laughs> is all this for me Sunday school is about, is, is to take a, a scripture and try to, like, because Randy was done a question two before he answered question one. And that's, I want you to think along that way. Um, I don't know. I, I would think, hope not. I think that everything we're talking about today is about kind of like how to evangelize. And for it some, is. For someone who, like me, who's really good at complicating things, I, to me, I feel like you have to know, do your best to know each individual on almost like a psychological level so that you know how to present the word in the best way, whether it's through your actions or they need to hear it directly. Because some people, like if you just start talking about Jesus Christ and then save your soul and all this, they're going to be shut down and turned away if, if they're not, if that's not what they're, so you feel like, I feel like you have to know each person and, and approach it very individually and uniquely. Take the person that is always stressed out. You can go to them and say, Jesus Christ will give you a peace that you've never had before because you know that person and, and what you know, what is what is their problem or their issue in life? If you went and said, well, Jesus Christ, you know, we'll accept him, you'll, you know, you'll live a life of eternity. Well, it's not going to be no good right now. I'm stressed out over whatever. In Randy's case, I'm stressed out over the job. Go to Randy and say, you know, if, saying he's not a, you know, person of, of faith right now and say that, you know, I know someone that will give you the peace that, that you can't find anywhere else. Well, who's that person? And if we really have true faith, can't you just say, I'm going to speak to this person and God will tell me what to say? Sure. So don't stress out over it. You will. You might surprise yourself. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really good, and I would agree with that, but. Easier said than done. <laughs> well, not, not only that, but meaning well, if, if we haven't thought through the right things to say and the right way to present it, I know I tend to say the wrong things and do more harm than good. So I think we just need to be real careful that we're doing what God wants us to do. Pray about it. Pray about it some more. Pray about it a little more, and then go have the talk. And hopefully and, God is preparing that person for the words that you're going to say. Exactly. At that, yep. Well, you wouldn't approach an abused woman the same way you would, you know, somebody who's thinking of robbing a bank or something. There's different ways that you have to approach them. So I think lots of times you do have to. I agree with them. Of course, I'm a planner anyway. Um, you do have to at least have an idea of which direction you're going to head in. Yeah. With each individual person, so yeah, I agree, Casey, on that you have to know. You have to know the situation and the person. I think to a certain point. It's just some. I, I just wanted you all to think about things that that we go through every day. And you know, the first thing I when I read this, of course, I had read it first to preach on. So it's you know, I can't ask. You know, I can ask these questions, but I don't. I won't get any feedback or answers <laughs> of what you're all thinking, um, and I can't get to the level that I need to get over there. So I thought this. You know, once once I read the other scriptures, and I said, no, that's not right. But boy, we could really get into deep discussion about this, where we're at today, and and where the world's at today, and um, you know, where we're at. So. Yeah.
and you started this off. I mean, what I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Do we as Christians have an obligation to go to someone and share with them they're going down the wrong road or what they're doing is wrong? Or is it just our job to, you know, not, and I agree and I, I totally am on board, but it's not for us to judge. But if we see something, should we, and, and could it not be that God's working with that person? We see them doing some things and God's like, Come on, go talk to them. It's their, it's their time now. They're ready to hear this. So don't we have an opportunity? I line up with Brian. Okay. If, if it is someone of faith, I can go and I can, I can quote scriptures or example in the Bible and they will understand them because they are of that. I can't do that with someone that's not because it's I'm trying to sell someone a sweeper that doesn't have a floor you can plant a seed though yeah maybe they're not ready for a full so run. i go in a different direction like brian said you you go to save them first and then hopefully once once they get the spirit in their heart then they're going to look at life differently than they did before I was hoping that was what, because Brian's wheels was turning from about 20 after on. But he hadn't said anything, so I knew he was lining everything up, and I was hoping that it would be kind of the same way that I was thinking. But that's that's how I would approach those two situations. Because I could come to you, Randy, and, and put my arm around you and say, with love, you're messing up, man. You're a better person than that. And you would get it. And, and you would say that Denny is not judging me. Yeah, I'm messing up, and I need to, you know, I need to come back. I can't do that with someone that doesn't know Christ, that doesn't have that spirit with them, or that spirit may be there, but it hasn't, it hasn't blossomed yet. So, uh, somewhere in the Bible, I've read in those instances when a brother wrongs us, that we should take a Christian brother and talk to them out of Christian life. And if that doesn't work, go get another one. Yeah. Depends on their spiritual maturity, I guess. Yes. Just something to think about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it was happening back then. It's still happening today. And it'll, you know, it'll, they're all, there's always good and there's always bad in the world. I'm going to close this with prayer. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, today's lesson. And we thank you. Lord, for Mark uh, giving us the story about Herod and John and, and who people thought Jesus was and who do people think we are? Um, do they think we are Christians or, or not? And dear Lord, I hope we, we live such a life that uh, without a word said that our actions show that we are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.